It comes from Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Uh, we're going to be reading in the ESV. If you want to look this up in a, a Bible or if you've got a Bible app handy, we'll also project this uh, over here. But again, it's Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us today. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, well, we are getting into uh, today's message, uh, which is called the first law. So we've been leading up to our discussion of the law, right? And, and going into the Ten Commandments, we're looking at uh, basically the first half of the Ten Commandments today. And, you know, this whole year we've been trying to figure out how do we figure out a firm foundation for our faith? When we read the Bible, when we look at it and we're like, there's so much stuff here. You know, there's so many commandments and uh, uh, there's, you know, thousands of pages. And, and how do we make sense of this for us today, especially when it seems to be written so long ago? And probably the part of the law that is the most, or, or sorry, part of the, the, the Bible that is the most difficult for us to figure out, especially as modern believers, as Christians, is probably the law. You know, and, and we're just dipping our, our feet into it. But I wanted to mention what we mentioned last week, which was that we are under what we call the new covenant. And so this is one of the things, just a little tip, when you read the scripture, context is important, right? There's going to be times where you read scripture where we say uh, there's a difference between, you know, sometimes we say narrative or we say uh, uh, description versus prescription. By the way, in uh, the Bible Project, you're going to go more in depth into some of these things. But, you know, there's a difference between saying this is what happened and, and saying that this is what you, you as in Michelle or Connie or <laughs> David or Steve, this is what you are supposed to do, right? You know, and so maybe even there's passages where God is talking to the people of Israel in a very specific time. Right? They're, they're wandering in the wilderness, and they're trying to figure out how to be a people. And some of the things that you're going to see in the law are about that. Right? For a people in their very specific situation, where they don't have laws, they don't have government, right? they don't have police, they don't have any of these things, and they're trying to figure out how to be a people and how to you know, govern thousands of people who are just wandering in the desert. right? And so uh, the law back then probably sounded different to people wandering the desert without an organized society than it does to us today. But that doesn't mean that we take it and disregard it. What do we do with it? And by the way, as you know, probably for most Christians, we don't follow the law to a T, right? There are things that, I mean, they really look like commands, but we don't follow them strictly the way that um, you know, the Israelites do. You know, what do we do with that? Well, if you want me to prove it to you, just think about yesterday, Saturday. Have any of you ever sent a work email on Saturday? Do you ever do any homework? Do you ever mow the lawn? Do you ever shovel the snow? 
I have news for you, you broke the law. <laughs> At least in the, in the very strict sense, right? Because when it says, keep the Sabbath holy and don't do any work on it, right? That's my paraphrase. But they're not talking about Sunday. They're talking about Saturday. Shabbat, Sabbath, uh, in the Hebrew, uh, it's, it's just the word for Saturday. You know, that, that's the day of the week, you know? And so, uh, uh, obviously, there are many, many Christians, and probably, you know, none of us really have a problem with that. Why? It is because we believe that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, is fulfilled, and we will t be talking about that in future weeks. Uh, that's not really what today is about, is proving to you that, that that covenant is fulfilled. But what I want to talk about is if it is fulfilled, then what do you do with the law, right? What do you do with the Ten Commandments? What do you do with all of this stuff that you are reading, right? Do you just look at it as a historical artifact and say, okay, that's nice. It's nice to know that God did that for the people. Or is there something for us that we need to know? It's probably a question that many of us have asked when we, especially, you know, you start getting into Leviticus and you start getting into all these very specific laws about how, you know, ceremonial cleaning and, and all these things about dietary stuff. And, you know, why, why should we even bother? Why, why do we still have that in our Bibles? You know, but specifically what we want to talk about today is the Ten Commandments themselves. What do we do with that as a Christian, as people of the New Covenant? Well, I want to remind you what the New Covenant is. So uh, uh, if you were here last week or if you saw last week's sermon, um, we talked a lot about this, so I definitely encourage you to check that out if you uh, weren't here last week or didn't get a chance to see it. Um, David, can you flip to the next slide here? So what the New Covenant was about was about how to not have laws that we have to follow kind of legalistically, but how to get those laws into our heart. Because what the covenant really was about is how to become the people of God. Right? So God's like, hey, I'm your God, and you're my people. And if you're my people, this is what the people of God do. But in many ways, it's very easy to sort of like look at laws and just do those things legalistically, right? And just do those things uh, without any real love in your heart for God. You know, you, you can do those things and just sort of like check them off your list and be like, yeah, I did them, but not be a transformed person. And what God really desires when he means that we are his people, it's like a relationship. It's like marriage. He wants us to love him and he wants to love us and he wants us to know him, not just know his laws, but to actually know him. And so the laws do reflect God's plans and God's heart but he wants those things to be in your heart. The laws as they existed back then do not apply, at least not in a strict legalistic sense anymore. It is fulfilled. But if we don't understand the nature of the laws and what they were all about, then we will not understand what it means for those laws to be written on our heart. And so when we look at the Ten Commandments, I mean, it is, uh, you know, the most revered and respected laws, right? There's special words that they, they have for it, you know, the Decalogue and these different things where we talk about the Ten Commandments, and it is the cornerstone of the Torah. It, it, it is something that you can't just say and just dismiss and ignore without understanding what it's about. And that's what we want to do today, to understand the heart of especially the first law, right? Like, I mean, you gotta think, the first law is probably the most important one. It kind of sets the tone, and it does, right? And something in that for believers, it's gonna help you in how you read the Bible. It's gonna help you in, in how you make sense of how to live the Christian life, right? If you understand the importance and, and, and really what the first law is supposed to be all about. So, in talking about that, I mean, we have to understand uh, in, in many ways, one of the reasons why laws work is because of punishment, <laughs> right? Uh, and for many of us, when we look at laws, we just think about it in terms of, you know, how do we avoid punishment? You know, how do we get the good things? Uh, but in many ways, you know, when we think about laws, you know, it's not like, I'm not going to speed because this will lead to a better society and a better flow of traffic. Well, like, I'm not going to speed because I don't want to get a ticket. 
You know, I don't want to pay $200. I don't want to go to court. I don't want my driver's license suspended. Isn't that true? Right? In most cases, even in your families, right? Growing up, when your parents told you, tell you, hey, you know, don't watch TV. Or, you know, uh, uh, put your devices away until you finish your homework. Right? Many of us, we don't think like, oh, yeah, this is how I learned to be a more disciplined person, self-control. This is how I learned how to. No, we're not thinking any of that. We're thinking, I don't want to get punished. Right? If my parents catch me on my device, you know, then I'm going to get more things taken away. You know, And so the problem with this, brothers and sisters, if this is the way that we think about laws, that it's just about avoiding punishment, then it may not necessarily, just by following the laws, lead to what God desires in the new covenant, which is what? Intimacy, relationship. He wants us to be his people. He wants us to know him. Right? So if you just take a, a, a list of laws, you know, hey, don't work on Saturday. You know, don't steal. Don't covet things. And you just look at this laundry list of things. For, for us in our natural human condition, most of us just look at it as, I don't want to get punished, especially the people of Israel, because these were their laws. They weren't just religious things. It was literally their law. And there were things where there were real punishments in place. And so, yeah, they took it way seriously. You know, for, for instance, there's scripture later about when people were worshiping other gods and idols, that these people would, in some cases, be killed because of that. So for a lot of people, it's not that they're like, hey, this will help me love the Lord more. <laughs> they're like, I don't want to get stoned, right? So that doesn't necessarily lend itself to a close relationship with God. I, it's, I, I want us to, to, though, understand, though, the heart behind this word. And, and it, it, if you don't understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, I want to show something that I think is kind of cool when you see it side by side, right? Because you'll notice that Jesus does talk about the Old Testament law, but he doesn't talk about, at least not in this form, this first commandment. We have something called the Great Commandment. And I actually want to show those things side by side. And, and just in your own heart, and, and just a, as you think about this, what is the difference? Okay, so let, let's just look at This is the first law. By the way, some people number the laws a little bit different. Um, but I'm just going to use uh, the numbering that, that I've kind of learned. So here we see uh, verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So some people make that the first law. I am the Lord your God, right? Full stop. And then the second law is, is verse 3. But in, in many cases, uh, often I see that we consider this to be one law, right? I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. They kind of go together, right? Hand in hand. Right? And you will see that, that a lot of the laws, especially the first few, they go hand in hand. But this is the first law. This is what we're talking about today. right? And maybe for many of us, we don't really understand the significance of this. I mean, other than like, well, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. right? right? If you're going to worship God, if you're going to believe in God, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you should believe that there is only one God, that there's not other gods out there. And you shouldn't be worshiping Baal. You shouldn't be worshiping Satan, right? You should only worship God. It makes sense. But I want you to see the great commandment when Jesus was asked. It's very interesting because people actually asked him. They, they, they said, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Don't you think in most cases, most Jewish rabbis would answer with the first commandment? But Jesus does not. He responds with a passage from Deuteronomy, right? Ten Commandments comes in Exodus. Deuteronomy is two chapters later, or sorry, two books later, excuse me. Um, and he said to this teacher, you shall love the Lord your God. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Now, Jesus knows his Bible. Why does he say this is the first commandment? It's different, right? Do you need a refresher? Go back and see. 
Um, my thing's not working. David, can you go back one? So, I am the Lord your God, and you shall, uh, um, you shall have no other gods before me. Only one God. Only one God in your life, in your heart, right? But the first commandment, according to Jesus, is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. One is about really what God desires is to be our God, right? But he wants more than that. He wants a relationship with you. That's what the new covenant is all about. The old covenant is kind of giving you the boundaries, right? Because what you're going to find with the Israelites is that they are going to wander, like literally and figuratively, right? They're going to wander through the wilderness. They're going to wander to other nations, and they're going to be tempted to follow other gods. And God makes it very clear. I need you to understand the most important thing you have to remember is I am your God. You'll have no other God. I'm it. It wasn't the case in the time. There were many, many people, and there still are, by the way. There, there's, there's many countries where people have no problems. Like, like a missionary will come in, and they'll be like, hey, this is our God. They're like, sweet, we have hundreds of other gods. Right? Great, just add it to the list. Before the people of Israel, God said, no, I am a jealous God. You have one God. It's me. Only one God you worship, only one God you serve, that's it. God wants to marry them. Have you ever noticed in, in uh, marriage vows that um, they're, they're not very romantic? Um, that it's one of the reasons why a lot of people uh, like write their own vows, you know? And, and sometimes I kind of make fun of this where it's like, you know, someone gets up there and they're like, from the first moment I met you, I knew. You complete me. You're my soulmate. The sun doesn't shine as bright. I'm like, okay, that's great. That's not a vow, right? It's not a vow. This is a vow, right? This is a traditional uh, Christian marriage vow. I name, take you name, to be my wife or husband. To have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. According to God's holy law, in the presence of God, I make this vow. It's basically this. I will love you and be married to you until one of us dies, no matter what, no matter the circumstance. Rain or shine, you know, good times, in windfall and in scarcity, I will be married to you. It's not as romantic as, oh, you know, you make me feel like this, or, you know, like you're the greatest person. We take out all of that. And what it's really about is that that, that joining of two lives, that I'm going to be married to you no matter what. But at the heart of marriage, you know, the covenant, it binds us together. It tells us what the boundary is, right? Uh, there, there's even a line in a lot of the vows about forsaking all others, right? Kind of sounds almost like uh, <laughs> the Ten Commandments, right? You shall have no other gods before me, no graven images, no idols, right? You shall have no other lovers, no other boyfriends or girlfriends, no other spouses, just one. And you will be married to that person until you die. That's the boundary, right? But in it, there's so much implied in it, right? It's not like, like every day, you know, in my marriage, I'm like, man, if it wasn't for that marriage vow, I'd do whatever I want, right? It's not like I wake up every morning and I'm like, okay, well, I guess I got to be married to Aaron because, <laughs> you know, I said, till death do us part, right? You know, it, obviously at the core of it is this love, is this decision that I made to be in this, this, this marriage with this person. And there's so much that goes to it, through it, right? There's so much emotion there, right? There's so much love there, right? This is the person I want to be with for, for the rest of my life. But that's not in the marriage vow. The marriage vow is just the boundary, Right? And, and so this is what God is setting as the very boundary, right? I want to be your God alone. You will have no other gods. But Jesus takes that and he tweaks it. Well, he uses, it's also in the Old Testament law, but it's not the first commandment that most people think of. 
right? But I mean, it, it is something that was revered. It's, it's called the Shema, uh, or the Shema. Uh, uh, that hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your uh, soul, with all your strength. Here it says mind, but in the original Shema, it says strength. And brothers and sisters, what Jesus desires, what God desires, what all of us desire is to have the kind of relationship where we belong to God and he belongs to us and we walk side by side with our God, right? That's the goal. But this is the thing. There are many, many things that will compete with your relationship with God. And so what the law's end goal is all about is rights, relationship with God. Then why is it important to establish, number one, that there is only one God? For many of us, we're like, duh, of course. But brothers and sisters, there is a way in which the scripture talks about God. I am the Lord, your God. Lord, by the way, it doesn't say Lord like, like master, the way we think of it, is the holy name of God. It says, I am that I am. I am the great I am. I am your God. Right? The great I am is our God. And God, by the way, is not a name. It's a title. It is above king. It's above president. Right? It's above parent. Right? When you have a God, it is absolute loyalty, absolute devotion, absolute respect. Right? There's going to be so many things that you see in the law that are trying to flesh out what this first commandment is all about. Right? That, that's part of the reason why we have such a hard time numbering it. Right? You know? Because on one level, you're, you're looking at this and you're like, okay, I am the Lord your God. Maybe that's the first law. Right? But then the, the second one, like I said, you shall have no other gods before me. It's just fleshing that out more. And even the next one, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. So, the, the, you know, the, the second law, as we, m many of us understand it, you shall have no other gods. And then the third law is you shall have no idols, right? You won't make a representation of those gods. They're all riffing and playing off the first one, Right? And not only that, it, so it talks about how God is a jealous God, right? If you love me, then I will be faithful to you, uh, to, to, to the next generations, right? But, but if you're unfaithful, then I also will carry that over, you know? Uh, but then there, there's another one that talks about, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name in vain. What is that about? Again, you can look at these things as just laws, like, hey, just don't do it, because if you, if you do it, uh, you're going to get a punishment. But for us, I want to be very clear, we are not under the old covenant, right? I can't say it enough. You are not under the old covenant. You, you, you don't get punished the same way, right, that, that, that it was for the people of Israel who were wandering in the wilderness, right? Jesus paid the, that cost. Praise God. Right? He is the ultimate sin offering for all of our sins, for all of the ways that we break all of these commandments, right? and, and we, we don't follow God. Jesus died to fulfill this old covenant. Right? It's done. But the heart of it is still there. So when you look at something like, uh, uh, you know, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, I think for me, what I want to understand is, why was this on this list of 10, right? These just cornerstone commandments. And for a lot of us, we look at it as like, oh, you know, using God's name to swear, you know, when people say, oh God, or something like that, you know? Um, and I, I think that's part of it. But I think there's this idea of, if God is your God, there is a reverence that we need to have. There's a way in which the way we talk about this God has to reflect that reverence, right? And the people of Israel took this so seriously 
that actually that I am that I am, the Yohe Vat the, uh, the, uh, that, that name of God that was revealed to Moses, we actually don't even know how to pronounce it anymore. I mean, there are people, they, they think it's, it's Yahweh, but we're not exactly sure. And the reason why is because whenever they would see that, they were like, that name is so sacred, so special. So honored and revered, I won't even say it out loud. And so instead, they would say, Lord, right? And that's why it's Lord in all capitals in your Bible, right? There are still uh, Jewish people today that when people write God, they won't write out God. They'll write G-D because it's that same principle. We will not speak the holy name of God out loud. Now, is that being a little legalistic? Maybe. Right? But there's something in that, that reverence. Right? So I wanted to show you, Jesus is trying to make loving the Lord our God the first commandment. And it is connected to that idea that there is no other God but this holy God. But think about for a lot of us, if we don't start with the law and we just skip to Jesus, You know what we get? We get the kind of Christianity and the kind of religion that many of us see today. It's just so casual, right? Just the way we talk about God, the way we think about God, right? Oh, yeah, you know, if I I want to read my Bible, yeah, sure, you know. Oh, I I, I didn't do it. It's just, yeah, you know, I just didn't have time. I got busy. Oh, yeah, go to church. Yeah, I'm I'm not busy on Sunday. Oh, I got too much work. I can't go. Oh, there's a really important football game on. I, I, I kind of watch that. You know, God will understand. Hey, you know what? Because Jesus is my buddy. He's my friend, right? How many songs do you hear about that? I I remember that there's there's a song like, Jesus, you are my best friend, and you will always be, right? Don't get me wrong. It's great, right? God is our friend. But you will not understand how mind-shatteringly weird and amazing that is that the God of the whole universe, who is holy, that when people saw the name of God, they, they, they trembled. They trembled. You can't say this out loud, right? you got to revere this. If you were to see the face of God, you would die. That's what people believe. This God is so holy. But for many of us, it doesn't mean anything anymore. God's name doesn't mean anything anymore. It's a swear word, right? And again, it is not about being legalistic. I'm not trying to say like, hey, you you guys need to say gosh now from now on, right? It's not about that. But it's about really setting straight. What is our faith all about? Let me give you another example. If you make the cornerstone of your faith that there is one God, it is this God, he is your master, he is your Lord, he is the source of all life, there is nothing better, he is to be respected and loved, and that's what my life is all about, right? Look at what Jesus says. He says, all of the law and prophets fall on these two commandments. Next week, we're going to talk about the second half of the commandments that Jesus is talking about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. But he's very clear. The first law, it's got to be there. You've got to love the Lord your God. How? With everything. It's not a casual love. It's not just when you feel like it. It is with everything. This is what God desires. He wants to be married to you. He wants to be your spouse. He wants to be your everything. And it's a good thing. It's because he loves us. It's not to restrain us. It's not to punish us. It's because it is the best possible way to live our lives. And so when we read the Bible, we read it in the, 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 with the, the lens of how do I become a person of God? How do I make God my everything? That is how you should read the Bible. But this is not how many of us read it. Right? What, what a lot of us do is we pick and choose what we like. Right? And, and this is very dangerous. This is one of the reasons why we're going through this. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Yes, the Bible, all of it is true, but it is not all equally weighted. I want to be very clear about that. 
Right? What a lot of people do is they inadvertently give themselves permission to insert whatever importance they want on the Bible, to pick and choose. Right? You hear this now a lot of times where people are like, oh, you know, this is my favorite verse, or this is my life verse, or things like that. I, don't get me wrong. I have my favorites too. I'm not trying to make you feel bad for that. But I just want you to look at what, where this kind of comes from. And, and, and just for us to be like, like a, a little bit clear about when we read the Bible, right? And one of the things you'll, you'll find is the Bible's really long. There's so much in it, right? And in these thousands upon thousands of verses, you can find kind of what you're looking for, especially if you take things out of context. It's one of the reasons why we want to learn to read the Bible well. You know, another plug for the LGM Bible Project, you want to learn how to read it well so you're not taking things out of context. But in many cases, what a lot of us do is we're like, okay, it's all equally true. But when we say that, we think it's equally weighted. So what do we do? We take a verse and we're like, this verse is as important as this verse. Right? So maybe there's some obscure passage that you just happen to like. And we take that, that and we're like, that's just as important as the first law. Does that make any sense to you? Of course not. Is a verse that's just talking about a big, long laundry list of, um, you know, a census of the people, and we look at that, and we're like, oh, that's just as good as you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Of course not. Nobody believes that. But that's what we do often with the Bible when we want to make it work for us. One of the things we do is we call it, we call it proof texting. You guys know what proof texting is? If you've ever gotten in a Bible fight with someone, then you've probably seen people proof text, right? So basically what proof texting is, is you have a point that you want to make, and then you go search. You Google search for a verse that will back you up, right? I've used this example before, but I, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I had someone, uh, uh, when I was a youth pastor, I had a parent who was really mad because uh, her, her son wanted to get a, a tattoo, and by the way, the kind of tattoo they wanted to get, they wanted to get a scripture verse. Right? They're like, hey, this verse is really meaningful. I want to live this. So uh, they want to get a tattoo. And so, you know, th this very angry parent came up to me, had their Bible open, was pointing to this passage, was like, look, it says you shall not mark your flesh. Right? It's very clear in the Bible. Right? That means no tattoos. Can you tell, can you show this passage to my kid so they won't want to get a tattoo? I'm like, do, do you realize where you're pointing? You, you, by the way, you're in the Old Testament. And in that, there's stuff about like not eating cheeseburgers and not mixing like, like fabrics. You know, don't mix like silk and rayon and cotton and, and all these things. Do you follow all those laws? But you are pointing out this one because you just don't want your kid to get a tattoo. And by the way, what it's talking about is the ritual markings that was idol worship. Right? It was in sort of like witchcraft or you know, in worshiping in different ways not of God. It's not talking about you know, tattooing a scripture verse on your arm. You know? and, and by the way, there may be many, many reasons not to get a tattoo. I'm not saying get a tattoo, but I'm like, hey, you can tell your kid not to get a tattoo, but don't twist scripture. Right? Don't use it just to prove your point. Right? I mean, if you're going to handle scripture, you want to handle it correctly. Right? But at the end of the day, man, I mean, okay, I'm, I'm not going to make too fine a point of this, but if the greater point is how does this person become a person of God who loves God with all that he is, maybe you could argue that getting a tattoo in that way might actually help in that. Again, we're not being legalistic. Right? But one of the things that we want to learn, and one of the things that we have the freedom to do, is how to figure out how do we live out this law, not to obey it because we don't want to get punished, not to do it just to, to, to feel morally superior to other people. Oh, I followed the law. I'm a good Christian or whatever. But because we want to be the people of God, we want to have a right relationship with God, right? And so when you read scripture, I, I'm not saying that this will explain everything for you, but that has to be your heart, right? And one of the things you should be really, really suspicious of is when the Bible um, kind of like, like backs up your ego, makes you prouder, makes you feel more powerful, makes you feel superior to other people. You know why? Because what is the first law? 
There is no other God. And that includes you. That includes me. I ain't God. I, I, I don't know if I'm stretching this too far. I mean, you, you can be the judge. I think some people read the Bible so they can be God. Can I say that again? I think some people read the Bible so they can be God. They use it to prove their point. They use it to prove them. People have done this throughout the ages, right? They're like, hey, well, there's slavery in the Bible, so slavery must be okay. There's stuff talking to slaves, right, about how you should obey your masters. Brothers and sisters, it's not saying slavery is okay. It was in a time where there was already slaves. And by the way, a lot of those passages are telling the slave owners not to mistreat their slaves. It's not saying you have all the authority and God is okay with slavery. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying if slavery already exists, then you better love your slaves and treat them kindly because they're human beings. And you are not God, right? But this is what we so often do. We look at these things, and we just make them serve us in our agenda. It says in Scripture, may God be true and every man a lie. And there is many of us, we want to be God. We want to be superior. We want to be in control. We want the Bible to serve us, not the other way around. So there's got to be a great humility. I mean, it is probably the number one thing that I would say when you go to read the Bible. You've got to be humble. Why? So what is the first law? There is no other God, right? We respect and revere and humble ourselves before this God. We submit ourselves to this God. Yes, we want to be in a loving relationship with God, and there's so much that goes into that. There's so much freedom in that. I mean, it would have been so incredible to, for, for people who grew up with the Ten Commandments to see Jesus, the Messiah, the one true Son of God, call God Abba. I mean, it's very similar in Korean, Appa. There's so many, you know, Papa. This very intimate term for God. You actually don't see that in the Old Testament at all. Nobody talked to God that way. Right? And, and it would have been so awesome and wonderful. But f- what we do is we flip it. We start with Appa, right? And we, 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 we're just like, ah, Old Testament, fulfilled. We, we don't need to do any of that. I just want to be close to God, chummy with God, just tell God whatever I want. Man, there's some of us, the way we talk to God, we're like demanding of God when God doesn't give us what we want. God, if you don't end the quarantine, then I won't believe in you. It's like, yo, who are you talking to? Right? Hmm, no. Now, there can be a closeness in that relationship, right? But you got to start with the first law. You ain't God. You need to be knocked from that pedestal. And when God brings you close, which he does, then you're floored by that. You're humbled by that. It endears you to God. It doesn't make you the master, right? So brothers and sisters, um, Even in something like, I just want to point out in closing that the Sabbath, right? When it talks about, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Why? But the Sabbath is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. So in other words, brothers and sisters, if God, who is all-powerful, he rested for us who are not God, who are we to not rest? You have limits. You're a human being. You're finite. This is the way that God created us. It is something for us to practice a rhythm of rest. I'm not saying legalistically. I'm not saying that that all of a sudden on Saturday now that you should stop all work and don't send any work emails. That's not what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. But I'm saying there's a principle here for us to learn. And the principle is you are not God. This is why we observe the Sabbath. There's just a lot of wisdom in it, right? But there are many things like this. And for us, what we 
in our freedom as Christ followers to look at these kinds of things and say, would this be something that helps me to remember who God is in my life and to learn to honor him, respect him, love him, and believe and trust in him more? Right? Those are the kinds of things that I want to do. And one of the things that may help you to do that is every seven days, take a day where you don't do work. You're going to want to do work because you want to be in control. You want to be the God of your life. I can keep going. I I can do it. I'm stronger than most people. No, you aren't. You're not God. And it's humbling. It's absolutely humbling to submit yourself and say, God, I'm not going to do work today. I'm going to trust you can run the universe. You can run my life. You You can do things perfectly well without me lifting a finger. I'm going to trust that. I'm going to just rest in that. And if you do it in that heart, I think it would grow your trust in God. It would grow your love for God, right? Well, brothers and sisters, let's just take a moment. I know that was a lot, so let's just kind of soak that in. You know, if I can ask the the praise team, you guys can start to make your way up here. How can we gain this right relationship with God. That's the law's end goal, right? And that first law, you shall have no other gods before me. Maybe, brothers and sisters, what we need to do right now is to just take inventory. Are there other things that we have turned to? You know, we may not think of it as a God. We, you know, we may not think we're, we're bowing down idol worship or burning incense or anything like that, but maybe there's something in your life that has become so important You know, you've just looked to it. You've looked to it for your hope, your salvation. Maybe during this pandemic, there's this one thing. Uh, Pastor David, during our retreat, was talking about this, how all of us, we kind of think like, man, if I had this one thing, then everything would be better. You shall have no other gods before me. Can we just confess the ways that, you know, not in a spirit of fear, not in a spirit of condemnation or fear of punishment, But in that heart of wanting God to be our God, wanting to be in right relationship with God, maybe we can confess. It's one of the wonderful things about our relationship with Christ. We are forgiven. There's grace that covers all these things. So you can be honest. You don't need to hide anymore. In what way is God not fully your God? In what way have you been turning to other things? In what ways... Have you been trying to be the God of your own life? It's exhausting, isn't it? Can we just lay down that burden? We don't have to be God. We can rest. We can rest in his arms. Sabbath doesn't have to be one whole dedicated day, but maybe Sabbath can be in this moment as we pray. Seriously, brothers and sisters, can you just take a deep breath in through your nose? out through your mouth? Is there tension in your shoulders? Is there something that's occupying your mind? You've just been turning over again and again because you feel like you have to be God? You have to control that? You gotta be the one to figure that out? This has just been bothering us and burdening us and weighing us down. Can you just in faith lay that down before God and even say, God, I'm not God. I'm not you. I can't carry this. There is no other God but you. Oh God, we confess there are many ways when we read scripture, when we live our lives, when we think about our faith. God, we confess that we've wanted to be God. We've wanted to be in control. God, but maybe just some of us are just really tired of that. We want to confess, God, again, that you are God. We want there to be no other gods, not even ourselves. We want to love you. We want to be in right relationship with you, God. Lord, may we learn to be humbled to be broken of our pride, to be broken of our need to be in control. 
May we find ways, God, to rest in you, to rest in complete surrender, in knowing, God, that you are trustworthy, you love us, and you have this whole world in your hands, as it rightfully should be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.